see we have a short agenda today, so that's good. Um, so Dr. Stoker, we'll start off with you and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Kern. Um, so the information, we try to put as many bullet points as we could onto the agenda, so um, we'll just go through the agenda and pace ourselves through that. If you have questions, um, please ask those when we cover those different um, topics. So the first thing that we have up there tonight is summer program reports. We ran the Open Horizons Summer STEAM Camp and Middle School Inspire programs this summer. Does anyone have questions on those? Okay. Hearing none, um, on the bottom of that page, scrolling down, last year we ran an after school tutoring program in our buildings. We're looking to continue that this year. Um, our high school and middle school are set to begin those programs soon. There's some information there on those programs. Does anybody have questions on that? Okay. Um, next is a bullying prevention program that uh, we're looking to run at Sladington Elementary School. Uh, there's an attachment you can yes. click on for that. Does anybody have questions on that? Oh, okay, I'll be out. Back door. All right. Um, not hearing any in that area. The next one is Gateway to English Adult Education Classes Flyer. Um, our English language development program is looking to run evening ESL classes. This would be for any uh, parent in the district, anybody who has a child in the district um, that would like to become more proficient in English. Um, it's a program that we're running and we're funding through Title III. Does anybody have questions on that? How do parents sign up for that? We actually created an email address so they <coughs> can email through that um, email address and that's uh, something that myself, Mrs. Mattiola, and Dr. Gonzalez man, and then as people register for that, we will um, respond to that. So the students that are ESL students, those parents would be made aware, I would Correct. think, other than checking the website. Yes. Okay. Yep, they'll be made aware, and we're also um, looking to hand those out at any new enrollments that we have. Okay. Yep. Any other questions on that? Okay, the next one is um, Canvas Professional Development. Uh, we've talked about the Canvas that we've been running through um, the summer into the beginning of August. Um, we are also looking to do a blended early adopters course that's been created um, from Mr. Pine and uh, Ms. Dunham. Um, the information on those um, are there as well. There's a syllabus attached for what that course may look like too. Does anyone have questions on that? Dr. Stoker, you just explain to people what blended learning is. I mean, I know what it is, but I mean, just so that we're, everybody's on the same page. Sure. So um, we currently are implementing Canvas at the high school. That's our, our big push right now is um, Canvas there because we've had in the past, um, they've used that program, so they're from, many of them are familiar with that. So that's the focus for PD at the high school. Um, in the other buildings, we are also beginning to implement Canvas, where we're looking for some early adopters that would be interested in kind of taking the lead on that um, in each of the other buildings. Uh, Mrs. Dunham, who is one of our technology integration specialists, is going to be running the, cor uh, the course. I'll pull up the syllabus, but essentially it's going to be some asynchronous model uh, modules. There are going to be some in-person um, learning as well. And then people would be walking away with um, different artifacts that they could use within their classroom or within the, uh, the uh, Canvas platform um, within that for their students. So it's a really nice course that they developed, and we have a pretty good interest so far. Um, so the course will be running, um, and we're looking for those early adopters then to take the lead in the other buildings. Yeah, this is one of the things that when we decided to go with, you know, whatever learning platform we pick, Canvas. Um, that we would start looking at more opportunities for staff to use blended learning, which is an integration of technology and direct instruction, and uh, sort of um, just a, bl a blend is really what it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm, as we go through the blended process, you know, once we start seeing teachers flipping their classroom, which is a whole 
different platform than blending. Um, it's, but it's a good start. And I, and I think it's important that, we, you know, that it's available. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of educators in our district that are very aware of blended learning and are probably going to jump on board a lot quicker. But this is a great use of technology. And, you know, I think it helps get through the curriculum a little bit quicker versus just seat time. Um, and it also allows students to become a little bit more independent. So with their own learning, which is really what we want to happen. I think it's a good a good good move. I think it also provides flexibility and a little bit of a change yep. in what they're doing. They're not doing the same thing all the time. Uh, agreed. You know, you're not sitting there in a lecture, you know, and just taking notes and then spitting them right back out. There's some thinking involved, which is good. Okay. Anything else um, <clears throat> question wise on the education agenda for this evening? So I have a question slash concern. It's not necessarily on the agenda, and it's actually in regards to the email I sent to most of you board members. Um, as far as assignments in classrooms that are given a point value because of a pronoun question. I have nothing against people who have different pronouns at all whatsoever. But I do have an issue where a teacher is giving an assignment that has a point value based on pronouns. Sure, I'd be happy to respond to that. Um, as you may have recall in my response to the school board, uh, that that particular question where a teacher asked a student for uh, the preferred pronoun that they would like to be referred to by the teacher, um, there was no point value if this deducted if a student did not answer that question. There was a separate assignment that was a Google Doc where if they did not fill out that thing, they could not proceed. Okay, I was not aware of that. Uh, that was not brought to my attention. I will look into that. Uh, um, I think I, had, I forget which class it was in, but there was a Google Doc where if it was left blank, which people have the right to do, mm -hmm. you could not proceed. I will look into that. I'll have a follow-up conversation with you because <coughs> I need to know more about the assignment so I know who to go talk to. Absolutely. And then the other side of the coin is something that I brought up, um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm hoping most of the board members read what my response was. Not so much what the assignment was, it's getting away from things that are point values that have nothing to do with content. Um, you know, for those who don't know, it's called great inflation. And it's great for parents because your, your sons and daughters come home with A's and B's. Uh, but if we're not grading for content and we're just using, and there's a, there's a whole way to do that. You've got homework points, class participation points, bonus questions on exams or tests or quizzes, um, extra assignments, cre extra credit assignments, all lead to, you know, f however we're getting a grade, points over points is a percentage which turns into a report card grade. That could all be infused with things that have nothing to do with learning. And my concern is, is how do we evaluate our curriculum and how well it is doing versus you know, what's expected of us with our mandated test scores if there's fluff in our grades? And uh, that's, that was kind of, I piggyback off of what Chad was saying, that's one of my big concerns. And I know you were gonna meet with the admin team and, and kind of start having conversations in that regard. I mean, I know it exists. I've seen assignments already this year that it exists. Um, you know, and if it's happening across the board, are we, do we really know what our kids are learning? Do we really know what our kids know and what they, more importantly, what they don't know um, so that we could address that? That was my concern, um, you know, being an educator for a very long time. It's something that I tried to get rid of um, when I was a lead. So it's something that, you know, I'm, very aware of and it happens not just in our district it happens everywhere you know and it's something that we need to address and and really keep an eye on yep. as we um, go through our curriculum cycle develop our curriculum evaluate it and then start to move towards common assessments right. we'll be looking at those common assessments and what they entail good and i'm glad to hear us going that direction anybody else have any questions or comments 
No, I share both your comment and, and, and Chad's, and, and I'm glad to see the administration is addressing it and, and at least starting to take a look at it, you know. And mm -hmm. We've said many times things don't happen in five minutes or overnight, but, you know, as long as we're, we're keeping it on the front burner, that should be great. Thank you. Yeah, I will say that from an education standpoint, we're going in the right direction, without a doubt. Very pleased that the step we've taken, and I think in a relatively short period of time, to be quite honest with you, um, which is good to see because I think we were behind the eight ball a little bit, and I think us, you know, we're catching up, but sooner or later we're going to get there, and then that's when you're going to see a lot of, a lot more growth is what I'm seeing. So those are my perspectives. Okay. Anybody else? One, one other quick comment. I, I had the pleasure today to meet John, our new high school person. Had a very excellent conversation with him. I was very, very impressed. Uh, he seemed very much on the ball, very much excited about Northern Lehigh, and he just had a certain amount of enthusiasm that, that maybe we haven't had there for a while. And he was saying, like, what can I do? How can I move forward? And, you know, just asking the right questions. So if you haven't met him, and I don't know if he's going to make it here tonight, but, you know, I think you'll all enjoy meeting him when you have an opportunity. So, uh, Mr. Roshevsky and Mr. Schroll are at the high school open house this evening. Uh, that's why they're not here. Um, depending on when that does, when, depending on when that ends, I told them to text me, and if we're still in session, they'll come up here. Good. Okay. Anything else for education? Okay, that closes our meeting, and I guess we'll move on to where are we at? Um, policy. policy. Good evening, everyone. I'm calling the policy committee meeting order and I will turn it over to Dr. Stoker to review uh, some of the current policies listed. Thank you. Um, we have three policies slated for this evening on the agenda. Uh, policy 202.1 is one regarding foreign exchange students. This was one that we brought last uh, month to committee and asked um, the committee members if they were interested in having two different dates for enrollment into the program. We, typically, we had within the policy to begin with a July deadline, um, which did not necessarily make sense for students that would be wanting to enroll in the spring. So we changed it to include a November 1st enrollment deadline for foreign exchange students for the spring semester. So that's the only change in that policy. Any questions on that policy? Okay. Hearing none, do we have the um, Board members present, do we have permission to move that to uh, the board on Monday night for a first reading? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our second policy this evening is policy 220. This is policy student expression dissemination of materials. It's uh, recommended by PSBA for legal liability purposes. It is a policy that we had, but we um, just had some updates to make to it that were recommended. Um, the title of the policy change from student expression slash distribution and posting of materials to student expression slash dissemination of materials. Um, throughout the policy, you'll see the definition of dissemination now includes both distribution and posting. So it's just to make that um, language a little simpler. Um, it was revised to more clearly outline instances of student expression that would be subject to the limitations, prohibitions, or in requirements of the policy, which are outlined in the policy in detail. And then there was new language that was incorporated um, regarding of the training of staff. Um, were there any questions on that policy? Okay, hearing none, uh, do we have permission of the board members present to move that one to a first reading for Monday night at the board meeting? I just have a quick question about sure. this one line in here. So it says, Evaluation process as such requests the limitations on school officials' authority to regulate off-campus expression. Can you tell us where you are what? in the policy, what page? Uh, it's the last bullet. The last bullet, the last bullet of the, that one that you just read. Oh, on the actual policy committee? Yes. Okay. So we're granting school officials authority to regulate off-campus student expression. Can we get a little more? So this would be training for staff 
to know what they're allowed to regulate okay. and um, how regulation occurs. So what we would create are ARs, administrative regulations, which would take this policy and then detail um, how we go about the dissemination of materials. Okay. So if I hear correct, Dr. Shepard, you're talking as far as... I didn't even see you back there. <laughs> as far as um, what the teachers are allowed to do, that's what you're referring to. Sure, and that's... As far as limits or anything goes. Sure, and that's typically brought to administration, so it's not really a teacher decision, more so <coughs> it comes to either principals or principals bring that up to superintendent's level. When there's... <clears throat> the clause that says uh, kind of like off the off school property part of it, yeah. the training behind that is actually something the administrators just went through um, as part of our admin retreat. Uh, that drills down to case law. What are we allowed to do and what are we not allowed to do? In most instances, when something occurs off campus, off network, off our devices, we can't do anything. Um, I mean, obviously, unless it's a threat to safety or whatever. That right, and mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Different, um, different and then that actually, And then at that point, we actually get our law enforcement involved right. with it. So. Sure. Or if it creates a nexus to what's happening <coughs> in the school, like inside. I think there was just a big court case on that one. Was, was it a cheerleader who said mm -hmm. some things mm -hmm. about her cheerleading squad, and, and uh, the school wanted to discipline her, and it went yes. pretty high up in the court system, and they said, nope, you were not allowed to do that. So right. and, and that's why that's, like, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just scroll through here, and I just caught that last line, and I was like, wait a minute. That's all. And that was actually part of our training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, sure was. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure that's what drove the change. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions on that policy, 220? <clears throat> Hearing none, do we have permission from the board members present to move that to Monday nights for a um, first reading? Sure. Okay. Sure. All right, the last policy this evening is policy 913. This is dealing with non-school organizations, groups, and individuals. So similar to what we just talked about, um, it's recommended again for legal liability purposes from um, PSBA. It only applies to requests from non-school organizations, groups, and individuals, and that is um, defined within the policy of what constitutes those terms. Um, again, distribution and posting were changed to just dissemination. The definition of non-school materials was expanded. Um, throughout a lot of our policies, they've changed from nicotine to vaping products, so that's not just in these policies, but in several as they update them. Um, updated the qualifier materially and substantially <coughs> disrupt or interfere with the educational process. And then references to social media channels and the social media policy were also added so that they tie into that. Any questions on policy 913? Okay, hearing none, do we have the permission of the board members present to move that to Monday night for first reading at the board meeting? So, so this policy covers uh, people that are spectating at events? Is that not, am I reading that correctly? Um, when I see the word individual, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Most often this comes into play when a, um, we're requested to share information on behalf of another organization or an individual. For, for example, um, Northern Lehigh Recreation wants us to post something about their summer program. So oh, all, okay. all, all, right. all flyers that get either sent out uh, typically from me through our Connect Ed system, that's like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Recreation Authority, um, Education Foundation. By the way, we're having a fundraiser Monday. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, nothing is allowed to be sent out unless, per the policy, I actually gotcha. approve it. Okay. Yeah, nice. we get a lot of um, nice colleges as well. All right. So the colleges the individuals threw me off, but now we understand. Yeah. All right. Where's the fundraiser thing being held up? Drizzle ice cream, cream shop, cream. white shopping center, Shacksville. <laughs> <laughs> Three to nine. Three to Three nine. nine. <laughs> the camera. Speak to the camera. Speak to the camera. But that, that, those type of examples. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that policy? All right. On, yeah. on, that, on that policy, sure. no. But I do have a non-agenda policy question. Absolutely. If there are no more questions on that one, do we have the permission of the board members present to move that to Monday night for our first reading? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. No. Um, so I have a couple students and parents reach out to me about a dress code question. Okay. Some students are wearing things to school, style shirts that I'm actually wearing right now that have a certain logo on the sleeve that actually has a gun in the logo. Technically, it is a violation of the code. Are we opening up this dress code to interpretation of what that image is portraying? As far as, so like right here, we have the logo is a cross rifle, grunt style is a name, right? I'm not, I'm not getting paid for you, but if you want to pay me, I'll take it. <laughs> um, there's no, to me, there's no violence there. There's no, there's nothing of harm there. But I guess by definition of the code, it could be interpreted as a violation. Correct. Because of the picture of the gun. Okay. Even though it's a logo. It's a picture of a gun. Okay. So, but we, in our curriculum, we have history classes that have images of men and women with guns. Embedded in the curriculum. Okay. So, so, <coughs> so that's okay, but this is not. The curriculum is school board approved. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No. Uh, just agree to disagree, but okay. I understand. Any other questions on policy? Yes. I got a question. Can you, about can you just that. identify yourself so we can? I'm Gabriel Schiffer. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. The first name is Gabriel. Yes. Gabriel. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry. So if the school curriculum is okay with having gun in the textbooks. Why is it? Why aren't you allowed to? What would you say? Express yourself. In your interests on the clothing that you wear. Again, I'll go back to the school curriculum is board approved, so it's part of the instructional program. Uh, clothing is not, uh, and the school board, through policy, has approved that images of guns and weapons are not allowed in school. And also alcohol, right? Alcohol, tobacco, um, like drug paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. Uh, profanity. Prof like yeah. curse words. Because there's other kids wearing Corona hats, Budweiser, and all these other different types of hats, but they are not getting singled out. That's, uh, go ahead. So that's something that you know brought to our attention we'll certainly address but the the policy I brought up it does say anything that promotes alcohol drugs tobacco um, so that that is something that's encompassed in our policy that would be addressed if brought to our attention and, and they shouldn't even be wearing hats in the first place so yeah. thank you for bringing that uh, I will have that conversation with our school principals I just want to ask this because I'm not very good at public speaking I check <laughs> on this flight um, our son was told to take his hat off directly two seats over from him was a kid wearing a Corona hat. My son has worn his grown style shirt on numerous occasions and has been told that it's a violation of the dress code. And, and I understand those things, I do. Um, however, three of the other kids in the school were in the same one and weren't told at all. Um, his, his assistant principal currently um, calls the classrooms that he's in and asks what is Brayden wearing why is Brayden is Brayden in class? And basically dictating to the teacher why it has to be. Why is that allowed? But other kids are letting allowed to just freely wear everything else. So consistency is something that we're absolutely looking to address and crack down on this year. And all of the students have received that message numerous times moving to the first few days of school. Um, as far as your specific <coughs> sample with with your son, I'd like to have a follow up conversation with you about that because it's more. Um, it's like your child. I don't want to have that conversation in public about your child. Um, 
but I would like to have that follow-up conversation with you and then also be able to loop back to administration about it. Yeah, absolutely. C consistency this year is um, a major <coughs> emphasis from day one this year, you know, at the buildings, uh, as far as dress code goes. Today he had his hat on, and three other kids had it on. Did you want specifically with him first? And he questioned her, why'd you come to me first? My son that does have anxiety. Um, it's a comfort thing for him, and I know it's against rules, however, we're working on that. Um, but I, he doesn't understand why he's the one being gone to first. Like, why doesn't the teacher stand in the front of the classroom and tell everybody to take along? Like, those are the things. Like, I feel like these kids are being pointed out for those reasons when it could be broadly across the country. Absolutely. Actually, it needs to be broadly across the, school, the schools and district. I agree. I was just going to say, like, yeah. if you're going to enforce the dress code yep. across the board, enforce it. That's, That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I would like to follow up with you afterwards, and maybe we can schedule something uh, with us and uh, either Mr. Uh, Ruszewski or um, Mr. Schroll. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions on policy this evening? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Arthritis. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, it's going to yeah, get better. It's going to get worse. <laughs> Piano playing for many years. All right. I have no other questions. I want to thank those who are here and bringing some of those items to our attention and to the administration for making sure that consistency does happen. That is part of what we've been talking about um, going through our school year this year was, was a priority for us. So um, thank you again for coming in and talking. We appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, our next policy meeting is Monday, October 3rd. Yes, October. <laughs> but other than that, I would like to close the meeting and move on to uh, technology buildings and grounds. I think that's Ms. Culp since uh, Mr. Disler and Mr. Yeah. Borch are not here. So, Donna? Um, I think we left. I said if you're Donna, oh, I'm going to be back. So. Okay. I feel like Rick started off. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, everyone. The first agenda item the concrete pad out back for the instructional tent is poured it is complete i've talked about this project probably for three or four months at least um we moved forward and got the project finished as early as we could and i'm looking for a board motion to allow us to uh, approve the agreement and get the contractor paid the cost of the project was $26,000, $26,250, I believe. And uh, I'm looking for a board motion to be approved on Monday evening. Any questions on that project or the motion? So it's free if we don't vote on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Well, I, I asked up front and nobody objected. <laughs> I would like to remind the board that this is because we had to lock in. You know, one, we only received one I'm, I'm bid. I'm just asking a question. That's a good question. But just, for, just for clarity, we, only, we received only one bid after posting it, uh, a request for proposals twice. We received one bid, and then the other issue was the timing um, we wanted to get the cement poured when the contractor was available. Uh, we had a window where we could do that prior to the ground freezing, uh, that type of things. So yeah, Greg, Greg didn't give us months, you know. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. 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 so um, I'm is fine that, with it. Is everybody yeah. else fine with it? Where is that money coming from? The, the cost of the project is, is from uh, PCCD, uh, Essers. 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 Essers <laughs> Safety and Security, I believe, is the proper. Uh, it's actually the, uh, the Esser uh, through an avenue Great. for us to be able to uh, increase instruction outdoors. Right. Uh, so that's still part of the Esser money that came down through um, the COVID funding at this point almost two years ago. Is the enclosure on top yet or, or no? It needs to be reinstalled. Okay. Where exactly was that installed? Uh, right behind Slate to the near the playground. Project finished up probably uh, last Friday, so with the holiday and people being in the office, as soon as we have the opportunity, we're going to get it reinstalled and get it back um, in use. Wasn't there a tent also at the middle school? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that was there a concrete pad for that one? 
that was already there. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I know we have bought two tents, and that's so I think so. yeah. Right. perfect. Thank sure. you. So Monday evening there will be a board motion to approve that project. <coughs> the next item on the agenda, just a quick update. The at the end of last month, ELA Sport, who is working on our softball baseball complex, and the McClure Company, who is working on some preliminary work for the solar array, they have partnered together and they are going to be uh, submitting permits from the county. So they've partnered together, they're working together, the project's moving forward. when that was just a partial approval just to get the permit. We haven't actually approved the project as a whole, correct? Correct. Just for clarification so that it doesn't make it sound like we've approved everything and it's, correct. it's strictly we've, a go at this we've, point. We've, uh, we are allowing ELA Sport to do some preliminary work to help us narrow the scope of work and the budget. So. ELA Sport and McClure are working together on the permit portion of it because we, the projects are so close together that you cannot have more than one permit open at a time through the County Conservation Office. So they partnered together hoping to get every, both projects through on one permit. No, I think that's great. Why not? So far they've, we've been working together and it's going well. The last agenda item is the middle school kitchen update. The project is nearly complete. All of the equipment is installed. There are two items that we're waiting on yet, which are two doors at either end of the serving line and roll up gates. So the doors are, after a conversation today, they are supposed to ship on September 14th and as soon as they arrive, the contractor will get those installed. The roll-up gates, they are still in order with no, no date on uh, shipping yet. But otherwise, the kitchen is complete, and uh, so far I think everyone's been very appreciative of the work, and um, it's a lot more efficient now, and it's going really well. Yeah. And, and seeing what the changes have been. I think when, once those roll up doors it's are all here, finished. it's all finished. I'd, I'd love to have everybody walk through. Yeah, I'd like to, to see that. Thanks, Greg, for keeping on top of everything. If there are any other questions about any projects or anything, feel, please feel free to reach out to me. I have one. I was just reminded of whether today's Wednesday. Not uh, Monday, today. which <clears throat> may explain door problems that we had. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> I said this was the only phone number I had. Before I, came to call. <laughs> I think it meant duly noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I know I said something to you in private. I just wanted to say something for everyone else to hear. Uh, you and your guys did an awesome job fixing up the ticket booth over at the stadium complex. Looks much better. Thank you. Nice job. Greg, is the, the folding door at Peters, is the, has that been fixed and good to go? Or? So it is fixed. It currently is working. Okay. I haven't heard anything different. Um, <coughs> however, that, that is on our long-range maintenance plan. We've had it maintenance routinely because it's, it's nearing the end of its life. Right. And we've had problems with it. So uh, currently it's working. I have not heard anything to the contrary. Uh, Mr. Schneider Wright is here somewhere. If, yeah, I if, haven't had an issue uh, with it since the near the end of last school year. Okay. I was just checking. I remember having a discussion on that and it kind of went away. And I was like, so it must be okay. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot tonight, um, but I just wanted to give a start of school technology update. 
Uh, our tech staff worked really hard over the summer uh, preparing all the laptops and Chromebooks. And what we did this year is we uh, delivered all the devices right to the classrooms. Uh, we had all devices from Peters, Sladington, Middle School, all the way up through high school. We had them delivered to the classrooms and to the uh, homerooms uh, where the students were. And the, uh, what we do uh, to start the school year, we always do a mass password reset um, for the students. So what we did is we, uh, we, we always have a challenge on when to do that because some students, some of the like high school students are still using their accounts through the summer. So what we decided to do this year was we waited until Sunday night before school started. Uh, and uh, Mr. Hawes ran his uh, script that night and did a, did a mass password reset. That way we were all here the next morning for when the students came in. Uh, they were able to, to uh, get their devices in their homeroom and classrooms and uh, reset their passwords uh, first thing uh, Monday morning. So I think that worked really well this year uh, by waiting till Sunday night to do that. Uh, we also provided a list to all the teachers uh, with their uh, students, uh, all the students in their classroom uh, with their usernames and passwords in order to get in. And uh, we did that Monday morning. So I think overall, uh, everything went really well with the technology handout. Uh, it's always uh, the first week or two of school is always really busy for the tech staff. Um, just till everybody gets back into the swing of things. Uh, it seems like we, we do get a lot of support requests, but overall uh, it went, went really well. So that's uh, my update. Does anybody have any questions? Um, all the projectors that you folks were looking to get put in or already put in? We did, uh, we did some high school projectors. I, I believe it was seven, if I remember correctly, over the summer. Uh, the projectors for the middle school did not come in yet. Okay. Um, those are due to arrive. Actually, some just came in the warehouse today. I don't even know exactly uh, what came in today, but we did get a shipment in today. Uh, but those will most likely be put in the middle school over the uh, winter holiday okay. because those were delayed. Thank yep. you. Anybody else have questions? I do. I, was, I don't know who to ask because it involves Canvas. Did we, did we roll out uh, the communication part of Canvas to our parents in our community yet? Yes. That's, we did? That, I, I don't well, know. I'm, 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 maybe I missed there. it. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to answer it completely, but I do know you, there are parents using it, yes. Okay. So I believe the uh, teachers that are using Canvas, <laughs> mostly at the high school level, then there's some, some others that are adopting it. Uh, I do know that they, uh, yeah, that parents are logging into Canvas uh, because we did get some, uh, a few tech supports for Canvas as well from parents. Okay, good. So, so they yeah. were notified and we're, yeah. obviously that's going to catch on as we go. It, it's yeah. mainly at the high school, yeah. but and right. there are some bugs that are still being worked out. Okay. <laughs> I was from, gonna say, it from, hasn't been through, unless I missed one of the 700 emails that I get, but it was not in middle school yet. No, no, no. So at, at the elementaries, we rolled it out um, basically at our Meet the Teacher Nights. Okay. That was kind of the launch of it with the giving parents their codes and then also sending them home. Right now, my building's about 70% enrolled um, and linked up. Okay. Um, uh, we're still having, fixing out a couple little bugs here and there, uh, but overall, um, it's going well. Good. Now, granted, my sixth grade, uh, my meet the teacher night was literally last Wednesday, so. Right, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take a little bit of time, yeah. but we're we're moving along pretty pretty quickly. Good. I only ask because I don't get those emails, so I don't know how it's being, you know, put out there. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll, show there there and, uh, I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. Mrs. Dunham asked me to, uh, we also posted some information on our website. If you go to the NLSD website and there's links for parents, uh, there's actually a link there for the Canvas login for parents. And then she also put up two instructional videos on how to create a parent account okay. and then how to actually use the app as well. So there's some information out there. Again, it wasn't shared out with the entire district yet, uh, but those that are adopting Canvas right now uh, do have, they, they do have that information available. And uh, yeah, so we are rolling it out. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, slowly right now. Okay. Not everybody. Is there a time frame of when that is going to get rolled out to all the district buildings? So the high school is the priority for this year, and then we're rolling out to the other buildings moving forward. That's what that early adopter, <coughs> okay. we're looking for some of the teachers. I thought the high school adopters. was using Canvas already. They were, but we moved away from it. We went to Google completely when we were through the pandemic. We wanted to make sure that we were using the same platform across the district. So we were oh. using Google, and now we're back okay. to Canvas. Got it. Okay, I misunderstood that. Right. Me too. I thought, I thought we were using Google. Well, I thought we were still using Some it. staff at the high school were using it right. yes. by the end, but now we're going K-12 uh, with it. Okay. So um, platform K-12. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, any other questions? 
thank you for the brevity, and um, we'll go to finance. So far ahead of schedule, and he's not even here. Yet. I was going to say, we're going to jump in. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. <clears throat> sure. So, um, just really quickly, last week we had our first uh, bond refinancing due diligence call on 9 1. Uh, Matt and I sat in then that afternoon. We had a Moody's rating call um, that afternoon. That was about an hour worth of questions the rating company had for us. Um, if you did read my update, they did say that um, the financial stability of our district is our strongest asset. Um, and basically, um, we should be getting our Moody's rating back by tomorrow morning. So by late afternoon, I should be able to forward, it'll be posted and then I can forward everybody out the outcome of that rating call. Um, and then bond settlement, um, the sale date, I mean, is uh, September 12th with the bond settlement being sometime toward mid to late October, the money will deposit it into our accounts. Uh, the other thing that on my agenda this evening is Portnoff. Um, we, a couple of months ago, we got a letter from Portnoff, and I believe I did address the board with the fact that we <coughs> have to, Portnoff now has to send out an initial letter to all people that, uh, it's a new law that came down that they owe a debt collector money. Um, they have to be issued a letter in order to be able to, to come back and say, no, I don't agree with it, or yes, I agree with the debt. Um, this year, Portnoff did that at no fee to us. Um, but moving forward, they are going to institute a $25 fee that would be passed on to the taxpayers, just as the initial letter that we used to send, which was like 40 some dollars. So if they do the first initial letter and respond to Portnoff right away, they're going from what was a $40 charge down to a $25 charge. And it's the taxpayer who pays. Yes, and it's the taxpayer that pays that. Um, at this point in time, um, what they did is they have, um, they asking us to approve a resolution that then adds that new fee to our schedule of fees, um, along with updating some of the increased fee costs that they have for some of the filings and stuff that they have to do, which is longer in the process further along um, when people are not currently paying their bills. So it would be, basically uh, to file rights um, of executions of properties moving for sale and that kind of stuff. So um, there is, I am looking for a motion uh, from the board, from this committee to move that to board for approval for Monday evening to approve those new port and off resolutions. I'll do it as long as you Yeah. Oh, yeah, I will definitely. No, no, that is November 14th of 2011. That was the original. That was the original port off. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, that was the original time. That was our original port off agreement. Sorry, okay. So that, that's okay. So that's how long we've been with port off. We've been with them 11 years. So this is an addendum back. Every year we just approve an addendum to that one, allowing them to collect the next year's access for us. So that agreement is still in effect. We just add an addendum to it every year. Okay. And the compliance That's all right. No problem. It took me a second to realize what you were saying. Okay, I'm sorry. No, okay. Speaking of I was reading something in one of the King Fry updates, and, and it said that a new law has been passed, and if I understand it, it says that if you're a first-time property owner, home buyer, et cetera, and you say you didn't get your taxes, you can't be charged any uh, fees, penalties, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, have there been any discussions? I mean, should, should we send out a registered letter saying you got it? You All know, right, so I will tell you what we do on our end because probably about, I want to say, probably a good eight or nine years ago, we ran into this problem where somebody said because that tax bill goes in the person's name. So if that person puts on their bill a, a change of address, that bill then follows the post office, takes it to them. And then those people, it's gone. I'm not worried about it. What we do is starting in August when those tax bills go out, when, once we get our August interims, we look back and we look at everybody who has bought property in April, May, and June, and we compare it to the tax rolls to say who did the bill actually go out to versus who should have the bill right now. We probably send out a good 60-some letters that come directly out of our office to people who the tax bill went to the other people along with a letter that says, we noticed that the tax bill went, it has not been paid, you are now the property owner, we just want to make sure that you received your tax bill, and we give them the tax bill. 
But, but I was under the impression, Sherry, and, and, and again, you're far more skilled in this than I do, that if they still said they didn't get that letter, and, and now a year later or whatever, it comes time to kind I of I think they have up. to prove that they did get it, whereas on our end, we can prove that we <coughs> sent out a second We notice. can prove we sent out, and that right, meets our Right, because we did copies of all of those letters, and we sent, exactly. Okay, because how do you register letter? I was just going to say, how do you prove that you didn't get a letter? Right. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> right. So I guess they couldn't. Right. The law seemed to right. say that all they had to do was say I didn't get it. And right, just, that they didn't get it. But I think on our end, then, I think as long as we can show proof that we, the first letter, yes, they could actually say no because I just bought this property and it went to the other people and I never got the bill. Okay. There could be a way around that, though. If you have the, the, po the postal app thing, that tells you what you're supposed to get. If you keep a record of yeah, that you do. for 365 days and you say that's not on here. Right. That way, yeah. I get this. No, that's no, a nice app. I like that. For all of our other mailings, if it's mail and not returned, yep. it's deemed delivered. Delivered. Mm -hmm. um, and that's right, uh, so we're, that's we're how correct. it. Interesting. So in some yeah, cases, it it's actually better for us to not send stuff registered mail mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it could actually come back saying not delivered. Mm -hmm. But if you send it regular postal uh, carrier. It's deemed delivered it's unless deemed it actually delivered. unless it's actually returned. Okay. So. so, but like I said, we do the second letter so, so that people track. can't come back to us, and then we save copies of those letters to say, "Hey, listen, we sent it out directly to you, to the address you reside at." I, then it's like Matt said, it went in the postal service. Your issue is with the postal company, not with us. You were issued the bill. section um, or shine after school program we um, had a contract sent to us um, for the sponsor to sponsor agreement between Northern Lehigh and El Tri C for the shine after school program at both Slatington Elementary and Peters Elementary for approximately 50 students um, that we will feed uh, dinner to uh, Monday through Thursday so four days a week um, Again, that's at Slatington Elementary and Peters Elementary, and it starts October 6th. Um, we will be uh, providing a different menu for the, this group uh, outside of what we served earlier that day at lunch, and um, it does have to meet the same requirements as the National School Lunch Program or the CEP, which is a branch of that for what we're operating under for this year um, in terms of um, supplying five different food groups, the protein, fruit, vegetable, grain, and milk. Um, it's at no cost to us. Um, what we do is we're gonna have somebody by the name of Michelle, who's familiar with this program, who has worked at other school districts, come and basically just get a feel for both kitchens because it will be their staff who would actually serve the meals. Our staff would make the meals and put everything together. They might do some last minute things with it before, um, you know, like putting it in the containers and distributing it. So they're just gonna get a feel for our kitchens, you know, get an idea of how to turn on and off our warmers, where our paper products are, hair nets, um, things like that. We will have um, annual audits where someone will come and just make sure, you know, we're using the proper um, food safety protocols and things like that. We did send them our inspection reports, our most recent ones, which is a requirement as well. Um, and we are just looking for, so basically, sorry I skipped over this as I'm reading my notes here. Uh, we will be providing them with weekly meal counts and um, we will basically be invoicing them $4.16 per meal served. Um, and that's, you know, that's basically, in a nutshell, the ins and outs of the contract. Um, we are looking to maybe make a little bit of a profit, maybe a couple thousand dollars at the end of this, because of course it does cost for me to get the supplies for this. So with that being said, um, 
uh, you know, at the next board meeting, we're looking to move this forward and sign the sponsor to sponsor agreement to get this up and going starting Oct October 6th. Will they have um, interaction with the students? Serving yeah, so yep. They do um, temperature checks. Um, you know, we keep all the components separate, like say it's spaghetti and meatballs or something, they will keep it separate because of it holding for that amount of time. Our last staff member is usually here no later than 1.30. They are serving um, dinner at 4.05. So things will be kept in the warmer separate and they'll do minimal assembly right before <coughs> they serve it and we're serving it in to-go type containers. Um, other districts do do trays. The only downfall with that, and we could look into doing that to save on paper of course, is they do not like run our dishwashers and stuff like that. They just do minimum, kind of just turn on and off the warmer, put the meals together, that sort of thing, so. I didn't know if they needed clearances. They will all have their clearances. Yeah. Okay. That so was, that was the uh, person <coughs> that Mrs. Fink referenced is actually the lead teacher for the program. Um, and then under her, there will be, I think, two staff in each school. Uh, they will actually serve the children uh, the meals that the Food Services Department and Mrs. Fink uh, pr uh, prepare. I think it's great. I mean, you can kids. Yes. The how meals, is it, technically. You know, how is it determined who, there's 50 students. Is that a number we chose? Is that... How does somebody sign up for the program once it's in place? Sure, so we, we uh, target 50 students as the number. Um, that becomes through a screening process through our uh, elementary principals, elementary teachers, elementary school counselors, and the SHINE staff. <coughs> really what we're looking to do is to provide this service to kind of like our most at-risk students. Um, this is an extension of the program that we ran during the summer with, in partnership with LTRIC. Uh, so really what we're looking to do is support, um, I'm going to use at risk again, at risk uh, for food insecurity, at risk for um, not having, uh, you know, as maybe as robust educational support at home as some of our other students do, um, at risk for um, even just going to, um, the, there's a, a STEAM and a social emotional learning uh, component to it as well. Um, so they actually have through a recommended, recommended, recommend it to the principals, principals review, and then from there it goes to the Shine staff, they review, and then we reach out to the parents directly. So the meal would be served in our cafeterias and <coughs> stay and eat in our cafeterias? Uh, no, the meals would actually uh, be served in what we're calling the Shine rooms. Uh, each building will have a Shine uh, classroom dedicated mm -hmm. to the program for after school use. And they would eat there? Yep. And that's students only? Um, I apologize. I, so if a parent came, right, oh, okay, it, or a sibling yeah. that, that might it's, be older, it's, younger, uh, uh, it's our students only? It's only for the students, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking of logistics of security of the building, where they're going in and out of, and yeah. those types of things are, are coming to mind. So the children won't actually leave the building at the end of the day. They just stay. They're staying here. They're just Got staying. It. And then we are actually... Um, uh, the Shine program is actually going to contract the busing company to to ensure the children get home at the end of the day. Got it. Yep. Makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. And, and again, Thanks. this is this is we are extremely fortunate. I think we're the first school district in Lehigh County to run a Shine program after school. They've been doing it in Carbon County um, for a number of years now. Uh, L Tri C decided they wanted to partner with Northern Lehigh School District. This. Um, they received millions of dollars worth of funding, so we're going to be able to continue this at least through the next six, six years. Fantastic. And there's no cost to the district or the families. Fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's good. That's, that's great. I mean, the kids, yeah. they're guaranteed to meet. Yes. They may not. <coughs> yep. So just to piggyback off of that, are they, is there, is there a drop dead time when you guys close up shop, when they have to leave, when does the bus leave? Um, I'll look to Mr. Durr for when, the, when we're targeting for the bus runs. I, I forget what time. It's a dismissal at Sladington at 6, 6 p.m. Buses would travel to Peters, get those kids that are out there at, by 6.15, and then from there get them home. So they would not leave school and they would stay until 6 o'clock? Yes. Okay. All right. 
Um, so, related but not related, we had a private discussion about this one. Um, I had a question about breakfast yeah. in, in schools in general. Yeah. Um, not to step on. I know you said you're going to look into it, but yep. just to bring it up. Yeah. Um, so, in a high school, particularly, mm -hmm. if you're a bus student, you get off the bus around 7.05, give mm -hmm. or plus or minus. Yeah. Your homeroom bell rings at 7. You have to be there at 7.15. So that gives you a couple minutes to get in, walk down the steps, grab something, hopefully yeah. finish it, yeah, and we, get to your homeroom. <clears throat> yeah, we, I've been um, talking to uh, Mr. Stroll about this because this is kind of what we, we ran into last year. Um, for the first half of the year, we had them sit in the cafeteria. Things were getting a little rowdy. They weren't listening to you know, the announcements as best as they could. We didn't have all the support staff in terms of like controlling that environment in the morning. So that where we came up with kind of grab and go, come down, grab and go to your homeroom to eat and okay. listen to the announcements. Um, so <clears throat> they can still eat, you know, once they receive the meal, but it is kind of a short window of getting it. It's like nine to 10 minute time frame. Um, and then we did have the idea and we're kind of just, I'm just thinking logistics of this and, and staffing that I would need to maybe like increase my breakfast person to come in earlier to actually have it bagged and carted upstairs because with the high school, the cafeteria being downstairs is a huge, you know, downfall with that because that takes yeah. more time than it just being all on one level. So we might have like a station up where like the lobby ticket booth kind of area is and have all the components in a bag. And again, weighing the pros and cons of this because the downfall of that is we're forcing the students to take <coughs> certain options. Whereas when they come down through the line, say we have two fruits out, they don't like this, they can grab that. We're supposed to do offer versus serve if we're bagging everything up and handing it out and like forcing the choice on them. Yeah. That, that, that's so, yeah. but yeah, we're, we're working through that as we speak to allow more time in the morning for sure that's like on the top of our radar so no that's great because yeah. that, it kind of ties in you know the yeah. shine, like echoing what we heard there's a, unfortunately there's a lot of people in our district that are at risk and that might be yeah. the only food they get so yeah try to give them as much time definitely. as many opportunities as possible yeah definitely great thanks good, good question and yeah. I, I like the answer and the fact yeah. that you guys are working yeah on that because it's it's, it's key also already emailed Mr. Brzezewski and Mr. Stroll just to say let's relook at the scheduling you yeah. know for that first kind of 20 25 minutes within the building yeah okay anybody have any questions okay. thank you um, the end of uh, finance hi everybody hi Michelle welcome to the extra co-curricular committee meeting <coughs> So first thing here on the agenda, some important dates. Uh, we have uh, senior nights all listed there. So in the stadium, we'll have all of our senior nights, recognize all of our seniors. Uh, field hockey on the 28th, girls soccer on October 6th. And a little bit different this year, to the way um, homecoming lays out. We're gonna do our senior night for football band and cheer on the 7th against Green Pond. And then our homecoming game will be the following week. Uh, against Tamaqua and then our boys uh, soccer senior night on the 11th and then before the homecoming <coughs> game we'll have the bonfire I know we're going to discuss that a little bit and then we'll have our fall awards night on November 2nd in the high school auditorium some numbers <coughs> happy to announce we have well over 200 athletes participating in all of our sports let me give you a little bit of better news. Um, today, we just added a varsity boys cross country runner and a middle school boys cross country runner. So yeah, so we, 
<laughs> so we have two more, and that just happened today. So they got all their paperwork in and they good to go. So, um, so some pretty good numbers there. Some great participation numbers, and and some of the numbers where we're low. The, the good news is that we have a lot more younger kids involved, so we see those numbers increasing if they're smaller on the participation levels. And especially coming out of the last two years, it's nice to see these numbers rebound like they did. Um, I'll be including some pictures this week to share team pictures. And I also have those on the website, some team pics of all our varsity teams. Be able to take a look at those on nlsdathletics.org. Mr. Geist, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. The JV teams, mm -hmm. can you, I, these are great numbers and seeing mm -hmm. seeing improvements and I know yep. we're still gonna be short on some JV mm -hmm. areas. Yes. Can you just go through which sports have a JV program and yes. which do not? Uh, currently our boys soccer and field hockey do not have JV teams. And we are not alone no. in, the, in the league. Not alone. Okay, not alone. Girls, soccer, we are trying to run some JV games. However, uh, we've had about six or seven girls who have been active participants in our athletic training room <laughs> due to injuries. So we have not been able to field the JV team uh, for the first three, four weeks here of the season. We are hopeful that they come back that we can play some JV from there. Uh, in football, we do have a JV football team, so we are running JV in football. And middle um, school, correct? And middle school. Correct, yes. In field hockey, we're running a varsity and a middle school program. And uh, our soccer programs run middle school in the spring. Now this is a conversation that we're having in the league is uh, number of levels and number of competitions. So in softball, we have varsity junior high, so we're able to have two levels, grade seven through 12. But it's counterpoint uh, baseball. Currently we have varsity JV, which is two levels for four grades. So this is a conversation that we're, we're currently having and been having in the league in regards to field hockey and well as boys and girls soccer. Do we include six grades for two levels or do we try to <coughs> pigeonhole four grades for two levels and then also offer in the spring? So we're seeing the league is, is looking to make that change in the very near future. So we're, we've been That's discussing that. Principals are fully aware of that as well. Does That's that, interesting. Does that help us or hurt us? Uh, it would help us in a number of our sports. Mm -hmm. And as an example, let's say wrestling, we've had varsity junior high wrestling for years. And then you have some JV wrestlers that you can set up some matches when the varsity team comes. Same thing is if we go to a varsity junior high model, uh, if we had an influx of sophomores, <coughs> we could schedule some JV games against non-league opponents or possibly some league opponents. So by adding it, adding the two extra grades that can also be helpful and increase our participation numbers and have them in our programs. That'd be interesting over smaller schools versus larger schools and how that falls out. When you look at somebody like in East Penn or a Parkland mm -hmm. or some of those larger schools, they kind of need more more choices because you're you're cutting so many kids out. Right. For small schools like, like Northern Lehigh here, it's nice to have a little bit more so we can get more of our, our students involved so that's a would that change the structure of the league it, it depends if we go back a number of years ago we had we had a model where we had football I use football mm -hmm. as an example we had varsity jv and then half the schools had a junior high program half the schools had a middle school program mm -hmm. the difference middle school <clears throat> seven and eight junior high mm -hmm. seven eight nine yep and and there's rules in regards to, to ninth graders mm -hmm. playing and, and moving teams uh, the example that I'm going to use now is field hockey. Some of our biggest schools are struggling the most in field hockey. So as an example, Saucon Valley, one of the larger schools, Bangor, one of the larger schools are struggling in field hockey numbers, which is not reflected in some of the smaller schools where we have similar numbers to similar size schools in our league. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Thank Brian, you. Sorry, what, what were the two that currently do not have? Boys soccer, boys soccer and field hockey. And field hockey. And currently do not have JV. Of course, we're not near as big as Northwestern either. Look what happened there. Yes. Yeah, by the way, great job. Yeah, I, I know you guys didn't do it, but I know you didn't it's do nice, it, it's, it's, it's it's nice to uh, yeah. bask yes. in the glory. Yes. This is how we'll phrase it. Yes. We get to keep the Mountain Road Rumble trophy for a yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. And then uh, bonfire, we, we yeah. can, uh, we're scheduled for the bonfire on uh, Thursday the 13th of October. Uh, we're scheduled to have a meeting with first responders uh, on Friday. So Officer Naus, myself, and uh, as well as Building Administration, we're gonna be meeting with, with uh, the Chief and getting all those logistics. And I know Mr. Stroll, Mr. Ruszewski are, uh, are working on on gathering a lot of stuff like food trucks and that and we had a very successful bonfire last year and we're going to refine it a little bit i think it's going to be even better and uh, it's, a, it's a great turnout for our for our community okay um up next i'm going to talk a little bit about esports so i'm sure many of you are aware <clears throat> about the kind of rapidly rising popularity of esports uh in even within our local kind of local school districts, uh, middle school right up through uh, even the college and university level are now asking, uh, offering eSport uh, teams. Uh, this is something that uh, a number of our a good number of our students, uh, some of our faculty and administration is very interested in. Um, so I'm here to share with you this evening that we would you're, you're most likely going to see a club proposal, a first year proposal for an eSports club team here at Northern Lehigh High School. Uh, we're looking at about, go ahead. What's eSports? Um, <laughs> gaming. 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 Electronic, gaming. Electronic, Electronic sports. Oh. oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Electronic games. So that's where. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't like leveled up yet. Like, yeah. I need like a couple of years. Get, get you're your yeah. way. Get yeah. Get yeah. You're 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 way. Way. So I apologize. Six and he did it. Um, <laughs> okay. I get it now. I'm surprised it's not five. <laughs> so, um, so what we're, we're looking to do is actually start a club team here where they would compete against other uh, school district club teams, um, potentially with travel or potentially just doing it remotely from their own locations. Uh, the initial startup cost, we're looking for about less than $1,000. Uh, we have uh, currently a family that's interested in donating a Nintendo Switch, uh, which is about a $300 donation. Uh, the Smash Brothers game, which is about $60, that's the game that the teams use to compete against each other. And then we would also need to purchase a high refresh TV or monitor. So that's like a, an upper end monitor for the gaming uh, for the appropriate resolution. Uh, for a full setup, uh, if the club were to last for a year, have enough membership, and we would have an advisor that would want to continue with it, after year one, we would probably have to invest some more in it just to sustain it, um, where it would then actually become more of like a competitive league thing, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a little <coughs> bit. Uh, here we're looking about a purchase of a $1,500 computer, a gaming monitor, a gaming keyboard, gaming mouse, uh, for a total of about $2,100 per setup. Usually a team will have a couple setups that, that multiple players can play at the same time. Um, here we're, we're looking uh, probably for about two to four gaming setups. Some information in the links there uh, about here are the kind of uh, local and national level. Um, so in, in traditional sports here we have the PIAA and then the uh, outside of PIAA is the National High yeah. School Sports NFHS. Federation. NHS. Yeah, NHF, yes. Their counterpart on the gaming side is the NASEF, um, where they can kind of set the standards for, for teams to compete against each other. Uh, locally, the CLIU is already kind of out of the gates with this, our local intermediate unit, uh, where they are organizing what they're calling the Rocket League tournaments for local high schools uh, and, and gaming teams through school districts to be able to compete toward, uh, with each other. Um, here we have an opportunity also uh, to be able to use some ESSER funding kind of for like the startup cost of this. Um, we're sharing this out because we want the, the board to know that the administration supports this for a number of reasons. One, it's another opportunity for a number of our students that choose not to participate in traditional sports or perhaps the theater or the, perhaps the band be able to come together with classmates under the supervision of um, a club advisor uh, to, to have an activity after school that they're highly interested in. Um, we now know that colleges and universities 
offer this. They offer scholarships, just like they would for a traditional sports uh, athlete. They are offering scholarships for students to go in and, and join their esports team. We also know uh, that uh, the instructional side of this has to do with um, uh, developing games, actually becoming coders that design and develop the games uh, that can go to school for that, that can come out of school and be gainfully employed on the software side of it. Um, so, you know, we're not looking necessarily for any any motion tonight, just to, but we just kind of want to get out there in front of all of you uh, that we fully anticipate a club first year uh, application to come in uh, for this administration supports it. I'm just curious, what, what kind of games do they play? So the only game they play? Right. Just yeah, right now, because, well. <laughs> <laughs> no one else is surprised by this? Keep, I don't know keep, keep in mind that we do not want to put out there more like the first first person shooter type game. games. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to That's what I was asking, too. We want to put in games that, um, would not violate any of our policies, any of the other district policies, um, that uh, also things that we can put through <coughs> our uh, SIPA filters. If, if we need to do um, SIPA filters, is the Child uh, Internet uh, Protection Act. Um, so we, you know, there's a very kind of narrow window of the games uh, that the kids can compete uh, using. Um, if more games are added to that, we would absolutely, uh, you know, entertain it. But right now, um, we're looking at. Um, the Smash Brothers game. Yes. So I was going to piggyback off. I was actually going to ask that exact question, but yes. I, I, I personally think it's a great program. I think it opens it up to other things, like you can have your aviation simulators. You can even maybe even open it up to a, a driver's ed simulator type thing. I like it. Yeah, I mean, um, but I was curious where we were going as far as what games, because yeah. yes. ninety. Yeah. 98% of the games these kids play right. would yeah. violate any yeah. policy yeah. that we have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can we play Tetra Ball? <laughs> 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 It's like Tetris from years ago. Anybody familiar with the game? Like Frogger or something. Yeah. Is anybody familiar with the game? <laughs> I don't know if anybody knew what it was. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of it is, is a lot of it is, you know, they, what they look at are called like arena type games. Yeah. Where they're in the same arena and they select the vehicle that they want to use, or the, I don't even want to use the word vehicle. And they're, they're trying to knock each other out of the arena. That oh, I've type done of stuff. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, right now that's, that's the game that we're looking at. We do have somebody that's looking to donate the actual gaming platform, the Nintendo Switch. Uh, we, you know, we would consider the first year kind of like proof of concept, and then if, if they have enough interest in it and they can sustain it, um, you know, then we would look to have it be approved as a as a um, a competitive club. Wow. Oh, I've done <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I mean, like you said, it gets other kids involved who don't want to do the physical aspect. And it gives under the, the guise of supervision. Do you have a do you have a staff member who I know you said Crystal was, was on there. Do you have any other staff who's interested? Well, Chris, right now, um, I anticipate Mrs. Tiedelman to be the one that puts in to be the club advisor. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, she uh, she's actually been published about uh, gaming. All right, so it's a high interest area for her. Uh, she, she's been published in different um, uh, media outlets, more so about like the history of gaming. Um, so you know, I think she would. This is something near and dear to her. Something that she's passionate. Cool, I didn't know that. Thanks. I think the comment was that ninety eight percent of them are first person shooters. The first thing I came up with was like Madden. Like the, right, the Madden kids playing football. football against each other. I mean I could see that being you know, I I, I never I, I didn't know what these sports were. I do I understand. I I have never experienced it, but I'm thinking, okay, well you put two kids, give them two controllers and you know, play a football 
game or a soccer match or something, it, it'll turn into something big. So. Any other? Just one other question for you, Mr. Guy. Sure. Uh, completely unrelated, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sports-wise, do we have candidates for baseball coach positions available? Are you asking for head coach, or are you asking for assistant coaches? Yeah, and or either. Well, we hope to have a person on the agenda for Monday. Or as head coach, so our normal process is we approve a head coach, mm -hmm. and at that point, then we look to fill up the assistant positions after that. That's great. Let's get the hand. Monday night. Um, Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> that is all we have on the ECC agenda this evening. If you want to open it up for any other questions or comments? Anything anybody wants to discuss? Did like the change in the cross country um, used to be alumni race having having it be a little bit of com competition there? Yeah. Just curious how that went across the it, the was, feel of who actually did it. I, yeah, I thought they, it was a great idea. They loved it, and a number of individuals um, had the option when with the way our course is set up. They're like, nah, I'm just going to do the 3K instead of the 5K. So it gives you the option, like, I don't know if I really want to do the 5, I'll just stop at the 3. So that our, our course sets up nicely for that. Yeah, nice. so it's been received very well. Good. Um, Glad to hear. Thank you. Yeah. You made me just think of something else, if I may. Great. Uh, Mr. Geist, would you like to share out um, some of the youth activities plan coming up in the stadium? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do on, um, not well, since we're at Penargel, uh, this Saturday, next Friday, the, the 16th, we're playing Pine Grove to, uh, we're inviting the NLYA uh, youth teams, football and cheer, so it's going to be family night. We uh, normally put our football cheerleaders out on the field, our, our youth kids uh, with our varsity cheer uh, for the national anthem, and they get to hang out with the, with the kids there, so it's uh, that. Uh, for our youth and then also one of the other cool things that we're going to do is uh, we named our mascot bruiser a number of years ago that was last year <coughs> So we are going to invite all the anybody who's interested in Todd and James's building So we're going to do a K one and two hundred meter run not a hundred meter dash a hundred meter run to encourage anyone who's interested in cross-country so they're going to chase Bruiser between <laughs> the, chase Bruiser in the first and second quarter, and then at halftime we'll, we'll see how it works with the band. But we're going to run a 200 meter run, not a dash, 200 meter run for three through six to encourage students if they're not involved with field hockey, soccer, football, to Fantastic. come out and run for the cross country team. That's cool. So we're looking at giving them bibs, some pins, get them registered, get them in as uh, to just participate and, and just kind of breathe some life into our cross country program. And I apologize. When is that one? That's going to be next Friday with next our Friday. Youth fam yeah with our our NLYA family night. All together. All together. Yeah. Perfect. More the merrier. More the merrier. Yes. yes. And then the surprise is that Matt is actually inside the costume. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's smiling, so I think you're correct. <laughs> I think you're correct, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> half the Slavington Elementary School could outrun me. <laughs> Unless it was the refrigerator revolver. <laughs> <laughs> it changes everything. <laughs> I, I, I think it's great. That's a great idea. I think yeah. it's great. I'll second that motion. Yeah. 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 And anything we can do to, you know, put the Absolutely. young kids with the. the yeah. God, they look up to them and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, we're, and everything. And we're going to do the same thing for soccer and field hockey. You know, any anyone. You know, we have a youth family night. We can, we can definitely. We try to encourage that. And show up for games. Okay. Yeah, just, got a question? Yeah. Has a question. Yes. Do we do this stuff like with, with baseball as well? With baseball, um, we have a senior night. Okay. We have a senior night over at Berlinsville. Um, we have because of most of that's the only opportunity <coughs> we have to do that since that's our only night game. Okay. Uh, most of our games are at four o'clock, and it's hard hard to attend those kind of games. It's definitely something that we'd entertain uh, with our youth programs, with softball and baseball. But we only have one opportunity, and it's usually for senior night since we play softball at Walnutport and baseball at Berlinsville. So it's, the, the opportunities are limited, but it's something we're definitely open to. Sure. Do, do we have any weekend day baseball or softball games? 
weekend um, depends. Sometimes it, it's hard with our current setup to play games on Saturday due to field conditions mm -hmm. and support personnel makes makes it a little bit tougher. So most of our games are during the week. Absolutely. And if, uh, if we hire a baseball coach on Monday, if you could shoot me an email or get, provide me a contact information, uh, I believe our coach would definitely be willing to talk. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. Anybody have anything else? If we're done with the committee, I, had, I just have one announcement I'd like, like to make to everybody, and, and this is as of... 3.48 p.m., I don't know if it's changed since then, I'm looking in this direction, but we have four applicants for the board seat. Uh, we have Mrs. Lauren Ganser, Mrs. Rhonda France, uh, Mrs. Natalie Snyder, and Mrs. Just, or Mr. Justin Jackowitz. We have those four people. Uh, I know originally we had talked about maybe interviewing at 6.30, but after further discussion, what we'd like to do is begin the, the vetting process, the interview for those four people at six o'clock next Monday night. That would be at six o'clock. Uh, we're gonna interview all four. Mr. Link is gonna ask the questions. And then what we're gonna do is in that part of the public meeting, it'll be only for vetting and, and picking a board member. We're gonna try and pick a board member in that, in that meeting. Uh, we'll then, assuming we can and that person's there, we will swear that person in, the attorney will do that, and that person will officially then be on the board. At 6.30 then, or thereabouts, we will go into an executive session. So instead of the executive session first, we're going to do that after we appoint the board member, and then that board member can kind of get up to speed quickly at that meeting. So at 6.30, we'll go into the executive session, or whatever time it happens, 20 after, 20 of, who, who knows, and, 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 and we'll kind of go from there. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Uh, so is it technically then like public meeting, executive session, public meeting? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. That's, that's the way it's going to be. And we're going to swear the person in. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask the administration to have Ellie contact all four candidates, <coughs> let them know to make sure there's no question about the time because we did toss around different times. Six o'clock will be the time. It's also my understanding that one of the candidates may not be able to be in town that day and we might have to do a phone-in interview. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. Hill uh, to make sure that we have a phone set up with a, uh, uh, an amplifier of some sort so that when the questions are asked, we can all hear the answers from that person. And, and I don't know about the other people, but you know, when we send out the email, we can ask for them to respond and let us know if they're going to be there. So uh, that's about what I have. Uh, so the regular meeting then, like you said, would be at, be at 7. Anybody have any questions on that or thoughts? If I, if I could just quick add to, add to that. Um, Mrs. Nemi already did contact all four of them. Oh, and okay. let them know what the, what the plan was. I think so far we heard back from one confirming um, they would be here. Uh, and tomorrow uh, we will advertise in the Times News that we're holding a special meeting. And it will also be posted on the website for the 6 o'clock meeting. Mm -hmm. Anything else? So that's, that's the tenant agenda for Monday night. 6, 6.30 and 7. 6 official meeting, 7 official meeting, however we work out. If okay. the first public meeting runs over and there's not enough time for executive session, can we move executive session to after? Yes. Okay. Exactly. We don't have to like, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, as of the last conversation we had, it didn't appear that there was a lot of things that needed to work in an executive session. That could all change till Monday, but mm -hmm. as of now, even, even a 15 or 20 minute meeting would probably be sufficient. But if that changes, yes, then okay. we would have to move it to after. Okay. <coughs> Okay, that's all I have, so. I'd just like to say thank you for the conciseness and brevity of the evening. Personally, greatly appreciated. Well, if we wouldn't ask so many questions, we'd have been out of here at 6.15. <laughs> <laughs> See, you, I didn't everyone. even have to eat my snack. You, you didn't have to open your snacks. <laughs> hey, I can cook at dinner. <laughs> and Tommy, you don't have to get home at 11 o'clock.